Aladdin returned home, in the order he had come, amidst the acclamations of the people, who wished him all happiness and prosperity. As soon as he dismounted, he retired to his own chamber, took the lamp, and summoned the genie as usual, who professed his allegiance. Genie, said Aladdin, build me a palace, fit to receive the Princess Budir al Budur. Let its materials be made of nothing less than porphyry, jasper, agate, lapis lazuli, and the finest marble. Let its walls be massive gold, and silver bricks laid alternately. Let each front contain six windows, and let the lattices of these, except one which must be left unfinished, be enriched with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, so that they shall exceed everything of the kind ever seen in the world. Let there be an inner and outer court in front of the palace, and a spacious garden, but above all things, provide a safe treasure-house, and fill it with gold and silver. Let there be also kitchens and storehouses, stables full of the finest horses, with their equerries and grooms, and hunting equipage, officers, attendants, and slaves, both men and women, to form a retinue for the princess and myself. Go, and execute my wishes. When Aladdin gave these commands to the genie, the sun was set. The next morning at daybreak, the genie presented himself, and having obtained Aladdin's consent, transported him in a moment to the palace he had made. The genie led him through all the apartments, where he found officers and slaves, habited according to their rank and the services to which they were appointed. The genie then showed him the treasury, which was opened by a treasurer, where Aladdin saw large vases of different sizes, piled up to the top with money, ranged all round the chamber. The genie thence led him to the stables, where there were some of the finest horses in the world, and the grooms busy in dressing them. From thence they went to the storehouses, which were filled with all things necessary, both for food and ornament. When Aladdin had examined every portion of the palace, and particularly the hall with the four-and-twenty windows, and found it far to exceed his fondest expectations. He said, Genie, there is one thing wanting, a fine carpet for the princess to walk upon, from the sultan's palace to mine. Lay one down immediately. The genie disappeared, and Aladdin saw what he desired executed in an instant. The genie then returned, and carried him to his own home. When the sultan's porters came to open the gates, they were amazed to find what had been an unoccupied garden filled up with a magnificent palace, and a splendid carpet extending to it all the way from the Sultan's palace. They told the strange tidings to the Grand Vizier, who informed the Sultan, who exclaimed, "'It must be Aladdin's palace, which I gave him leave to build for my daughter. He has wished to surprise us, and let us see what wonders can be done in only one night.' Aladdin, on his being conveyed by the genie to his own home, requested his mother to go to the Princess Budir Abudur, and tell her that the palace would be ready for her reception in the evening. She went, attended by her women-slaves, in the same order as on the preceding day. Shortly after her arrival at the princess's apartment, the sultan himself came in, and was surprised to find her, whom he knew as a suppliant at his divan, in such humble guise to be now more richly and sumptuously attired than his own daughter. This gave him a higher opinion of Aladdin, who took such care of his mother and made her share his wealth and honours. Shortly after her departure, Aladdin, mounting his horse and attended by his retinue of magnificent attendants, left his paternal home for ever, and went to the palace in the same pomp as on the day before, nor did he forget to take with him the wonderful lamp to which he owed all his good fortune, nor to wear the ring which was given to him as a talisman. The sultan entertained Aladdin with utmost magnificence, and at night, on the conclusion of the marriage ceremonies, the princess took leave of the sultan, her father. Bands of music led the procession, followed by a hundred state ushers, and the like number of black mutes in two files with their officers at their head. Four hundred of the sultan's young pages carried flambeaux on each side which together with the illuminations of the sultan's and aladdin's palaces made it as light as day in this order the princess conveyed in her litter and accompanied also by aladdin's mother carried in a superb litter and attended by her women slaves proceeded on the carpet which was spread from the sultan's palace to that of aladdin on her arrival aladdin was ready to receive her at the entrance and led her into a large hall 
illuminated with an infinite number of wax candles, where a noble feast was served up. The dishes were of massy gold, and contained the most delicate viands. The vases, basins, and goblets were gold also, and of exquisite workmanship, and all the other ornaments and embellishments of the hall were answerable to this display. The princess, dazzled to see so much riches collected in one place, said to Aladdin, I thought, prince, that nothing in the world was so beautiful as the sultan my father's palace, but the sight of this hall alone is sufficient to show I was deceived. When the supper was ended, there entered a company of female dancers, who performed according to the custom of the country, singing at the same time verses in praise of the bride and bridegroom. About midnight, Aladdin's mother conducted the bride to the nuptial apartment, and he soon after retired. The next morning, the attendants of Aladdin presented themselves to dress him, and brought him another habit, as rich and magnificent as that worn the day before. He then ordered one of the horses to be got ready, mounted him, and went in the midst of a large troop of slaves to the Sultan's palace to entreat him to take a repast in the Princess's palace, attended by his Grand Vizier and all the lords of his court. The Sultan consented with pleasure, rose up immediately, and preceded by the principal officers of his palace, and followed by all the great lords of his court, accompanied Aladdin. The nearer the Sultan approached Aladdin's palace, the more he was struck with its beauty, but when he entered it, came into the hall and saw the windows, enriched with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, all large perfect stones, he was completely surprised, and said to his son-in-law, this palace is one of the wonders of the world, for where in all the world besides shall we find walls built of massy gold and silver, and diamonds, rubies, and emeralds composing the windows? But what most surprises me is that a hall of this magnificence should be left with one of its windows incomplete and unfinished. Sire, answered Aladdin, the omission was by design, since I wished that you should have the glory of finishing this hall. I take your intention kindly, said the Sultan, and will give orders about it immediately. After the Sultan had finished this magnificent entertainment, provided for him and for his court by Aladdin, he was informed that the jewellers and goldsmiths attended, upon which he returned to the hall and showed them the window which was unfinished. I sent for you, said he, to fit up this window in as great perfection as the rest. Examine them well, and make all the dispatch you can. The jewellers and goldsmiths examined the three-and-twenty windows with great attention, and after they consulted together to know what each could furnish, they returned, and presented themselves before the sultan, whose principal jeweller, undertaking to speak for the rest, said, Sire, we are all willing to exert our utmost care and industry to obey you, but among us all we cannot furnish jewels enough for so great a work. I have more than are necessary, said the Sultan. Come to my palace, and you shall choose what may answer your purpose. When the Sultan returned to his palace, he ordered his jewels to be brought out, and the jewellers took a great quantity, particularly those Aladdin had made him a present of, which they soon used without making any great advance in their work. They came again several times for more, and in a month's time had not finished half their work. In short, they used all the jewels the sultan had, and borrowed of the vizier, but yet the work was not half done. Aladdin, who knew that all the sultan's endeavors to make this window like the rest were in vain, sent for the jewellers and goldsmiths, and not only commanded them to desist from their work, but ordered them to undo what they had begun and to carry all their jewels back to the sultan and to the vizier. They undid in a few hours what they had been six weeks about, and retired, leaving Aladdin alone in the hall. He took the lamp which he carried about him, rubbed it, and presently the genie appeared. Genie, said Aladdin, I ordered thee to leave one of the four-and-twenty windows of this hall imperfect, and thou hast executed my commands punctually. Now, I would have thee make it like the rest. The genie immediately disappeared. Aladdin went out of the hall, and returning soon after, found the window as he wished it to be, like the others. In the meantime, the jewellers and goldsmiths repaired to the palace, 
and were introduced into the Sultan's presence, where the chief jeweler presented the precious stones which he had brought back. The Sultan asked them if Aladdin had given them any reason for so doing, and they answering that he had given them none, he ordered a horse to be brought, which he mounted and rode to his son-in-law's palace, with some few attendants on foot, to inquire why he had ordered the completion of the window to be stopped. Aladdin met him at the gate, and without giving any reply to his inquiries, conducted him to the grand saloon, where the Sultan, to his great surprise, found the window which was left imperfect to correspond exactly with the others. He fancied at first that he was mistaken, and examined the two windows on each side, and afterward all the four-and-twenty, but when he was convinced that the window, which several workmen had been so long about, was finished in so short a time, he embraced Aladdin, and kissed him between his eyes. "'My son,' said he, "'what a man you are, to do such surprising things always in the twinkling of an eye. There is not your fellow in the world. The more I know, the more I admire you.' The Sultan returned to the palace, and after this went frequently to the window to contemplate and admire the wonderful palace of his son-in-law. Aladdin did not confine himself in his palace, but went with much state, sometimes to one mosque, sometimes to another, to prayers or to visit the Grand Vizier, or the principal lords of the court. Every time he went out, he caused two slaves who walked by the side of his horse to throw handfuls of money among the people as he passed through the streets and squares. This generosity gained him the love and blessings of the people, and it was common for them to swear by his head. Thus Aladdin, while he paid all respect to the Sultan, won by his affable behavior and liberality the affections of the people. Aladdin had conducted himself in this manner several years, when the African magician, who had for some years dismissed him from his recollection, determined to inform himself with certainty whether he perished, as he supposed, in the subterranean cave or not. After he had resorted to a long course of magic ceremonies, and had formed a horoscope by which to ascertain Aladdin's fate, what was his surprise to find the appearances to declare that Aladdin, instead of dying in the cave, had made his escape, and was living in royal splendor by the aid of the genie of the wonderful lamp? On the very next day the magician set out, and travelled with the utmost haste to the capital of China where on his arrival he took up his lodgings in a khan. He then quickly learned about the wealth, charities, happiness, and splendid palace of Prince Aladdin. Directly he saw the wonderful fabric he knew that none but the genies, the slaves of the lamps, could have performed such wonders, and piqued to the quick at Aladdin's high estate, he returned to the khan. On his return he had recourse to an operation of geomancy to find out where the lamp was, whether Aladdin carried it about with him, or where he left it. The result of his consultation informed him, to his great joy, that the lamp was in the palace. Well, said he, rubbing his hands in glee, I shall have the lamp, and I shall make Aladdin return to his original mean condition. The next day the magician learnt from the chief superintendent of the khan where he lodged, that Aladdin had gone on a hunting expedition, which was to last for eight days, of which only three had expired. The magician wanted to know more. He resolved at once on his plans. He went to a coppersmith, and asked for a dozen copper lamps. The master of the shop told him he had not so many by him, but if he would have patience till the next day, he would have them ready. The magician appointed his time, and desired him to take care that they should be handsome and well polished. The next day the magician called for the twelve lamps, paid the man his full price, put them into a basket hanging on his arm, and went directly to Aladdin's palace. As he approached, he began crying, "'Who will exchange old lamps for new ones?' As he went along, a crowd of children collected, who hooted and thought him, as did all who chanced to be passing by, a madman, or a fool, to offer to change new lamps for old ones. The African magician regarded not their scoffs, hootings, or all they could say to him, but still continued crying, "'Who will change old lambs for new ones?' He repeated this so often, walking backward and forward in front of the palace, 
that the princess, who was then in the hall with the four-and-twenty windows, hearing a man cry something, and seeing a great mob crowding about him, sent one of her women-slaves to know what he cried. The slave returned, laughing so heartily that the princess rebuked her. Madam, answered the slave, laughing still, who can forbear laughing to see an old man with a basket on his arm, full of fine new lamps, asking to change them for old ones? <laughs> the children and mob crowding about him so that he can hardly stir, make all the noise they can in derision of him. Another female slave hearing this said, now you speak of lambs i know not whether the princess may have observed it but there is an old one upon a shelf of the prince aladdin's robing room and whoever owns it will not be sorry to find a new one in its stead if the princess chooses she may have the pleasure of trying if this old man is so silly as to give a new lamp for an old one without taking anything for the exchange the princess who knew not the value of this lamp, and the interest that Aladdin had to keep it safe, entered into the pleasantry, and commanded a slave to take it and make the exchange. The slave obeyed, went out of the hall, and no sooner got to the palace gates than he saw the African magician, called to him, and showing him the old lamp, said, Give me a new lamp for this. The magician never doubted, but this was the lamp he wanted. There could be no other such in this palace where every utensil was gold or silver. He snatched it eagerly out of the slave's hands, and thrusting it as far as he could into his breast, offered him his basket, and bade him choose which he liked best. The slave picked out one, and carried it to the princess. But the change was no sooner made than the place rung with the shouts of the children, deriding the magician's folly. The African magician stayed no longer near the palace, nor cried any more, "'New lamps for old ones!' but made the best of his way to his con. His end was answered, and by his silence he got rid of the children and the mob. As soon as he was out of sight of the two palaces, he hastened down the least frequented streets, and having no more occasion for his lamps or baskets, sat all down in a spot where nobody saw him. Then going down another street or two, he walked till he came to one of the city gates, and pursuing his way through the suburbs, which were very extensive, at length reached a lonely spot, where he stopped till the darkness of the night, as the most suitable time for the design he had in contemplation. When it became quite dark, he pulled the lamp out of his breast and rubbed it. At that summons the genie appeared, and said, What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their hands both i and the other slaves of the lamp i command thee replied the magician to transport me immediately and the palace which thou and the other slaves of the lamp have built in this city with all the people in it to africa the genie made no reply but with the assistance of the other genies the slaves of the lamp immediately transported him and the palace entire to the spot whither he had been desired to convey it Early the next morning, when the sultan, according to custom, went to contemplate and admire Aladdin's place, his amazement was unbounded to find that it could nowhere be seen. He could not comprehend how so large a palace, which he had seen plainly every day for some years, should vanish so soon, and not leave the least remains behind. In his perplexity he ordered the grand vizier to be sent for with expedition. The Grand Vizier, who in secret bore no good will to Aladdin, intimidated his suspicion that the palace was built by magic, and that Aladdin had made his hunting excursion an excuse for the removal of his palace with the same suddenness with which it had been erected. He induced the Sultan to send a detachment of his guard, and to have Aladdin seized as a prisoner of state. On his son-in-law being brought before him, he would not hear a word from him but ordered him to be put to death. The decree caused so much discontent among the people, whose affection Aladdin had secured by his largesses and charities, that the sultan, fearful of an insurrection, was obliged to grant him his life. When Aladdin found himself at liberty, he again addressed the sultan, "'Sire, I pray you to let me know the crime by which I have thus lost the favor of thy countenance.' "'Your crime?' answered the sultan wretched man, 
Do you not know it? Follow me, and I will show you. The sultan then took Aladdin into the apartment from whence he was wont to look at and admire his palace, and said, You ought to know where your palace stood. Look, mind, and tell me what has become of it. Aladdin did so, and being utterly amazed at the loss of his palace, was speechless. At last, recovering himself, he said, It is true, I do not see the palace. It is vanished, but I had no concern in its removal. I beg you to give me forty days, and if in that time I cannot restore it, I will offer my head to be disposed of at your pleasure. I give you the time you ask, but at the end of the forty days forget not to present yourself before me. Aladdin went out of the Sultan's palace in a condition of exceeding humiliation. The lords who had courted him in the days of his splendor now declined to have any communication with him. For three days he wandered about the city, exciting the wonder and compassion of the multitude by asking everybody he met if they had seen his palace or could tell him anything of it. On the third day he wandered into the country, and as he was approaching a river he fell down the bank with so much violence that he rubbed the ring which the magician had given him so hard by holding on the rock to save himself that immediately the same genie appeared whom he had seen in the cave where the magician had left him. "'What wouldst thou have?' said the genie. "'I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those that have that ring on their finger, both I and the other slaves of the ring.' Aladdin, agreeably surprised in an offer of help so little expected, replied, Genie, show me where the palace I caused to be built now stands, or transport it back where it first stood. Your command, answered the genie, is not wholly in my power. I am only the slave of the ring, and not of the lamp. I command thee, then, replied Aladdin, by the power of the ring, to transport me to the spot where my palace stands, in what part of the world soever it may be. These words were no sooner out of his mouth than the genie transported him into Africa, to the midst of a large plain, where his palace stood at no great distance from a city, and placing him exactly under the window of the princess's apartment, left.